I want you to know that I look out at all you people out there and say, this is a mega church. At the Knox Reformed Church this morning, there was Linda and Alex. Uh, keep praying, keep working, keep knocking. Uh, and I asked your prayers for that. She said they had a good service. They had a prayer meeting at 2 o'clock today. And things went well there. Uh, and she's praying for us tonight. Um, it's a privilege, again, to be here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, Miss Megaly and uh, Miss Judy and Miss Arlene have been so kind to me. Uh, it's been a pleasure staying with them, and I want to thank them publicly. And I want to thank you publicly for having me here, inviting me. We're talking about Christ like this tonight. I want to read to you Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. We're going to be in several portions of scripture tonight, but I'm going to read two verses from Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. They almost stand alone. Jeremiah 2, 12 and 13. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. That's Jeremiah 2, 12 and 13. And Father, we would be vessels fit for thee, we would not hold uh, we would not be broken cisterns we would be servants filled with thy spirit we ask that thou wouldst work in our lives this night that we might be Christ like we pray in Jesus name and for his sake amen the, break, the broken cistern way of life will not work but the fact that it won't work is not the real problem. The real problem is forsaking God. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living word, living waters were God's words. Of the two evils, forsaking God was the worst. We need to understand that to look to anything apart from God... To make life work is to forsake God. We are dependent upon God. God has designed life so that we must depend upon Him. Trusting in self denies creation. God made man dependent. Man needs God. Man is created in God's image, not God in ours. Man is not self-sufficient. As much as he'd like to think so. Man is not self-sufficient. Man had to be told who he was and what to do. He had to be told what to eat and what not to eat. Any attempt to make man a creature that can live apart from God is doomed to failure. Man can no more live apart from God than he can fly by flapping his hands. Man is not a bird. Man was made a biped by design. And he's not an autonomous, self-contained, self-sufficient creature. Man is dependent by design, therefore any change that will benefit man must move man away from self-autonomy and to dependence upon God. It must move man toward dependence upon God 
for his very being, his existence depends upon God. Change that gives man the illusion that he can make life work apart from God makes man a rebel and destroys his usefulness to God. God promises hope, security, and joy to those who turn in humility to him. Psalm 1611 tells us this, Thou shalt, thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures evermore. Psalm 100 verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, he is God, it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. God is the good shepherd who cares for the sheep whom he created. Creation demands dependency. Listen, man can make a space shuttle. He, he can make a house. He can make a car. But since none of those things is self-created, none is self-sustaining. Things are dependent upon their creator. Man, man acknowledges dependence upon everything he creates, but man rebels against the thought that he is dependent upon his creator. The fact of man's creation has enormous implications for man. Here's the principle. If you need someone to make you, you need someone to maintain you. Let me say it again. If you need someone to make you, you need someone to maintain you. Man must face his dependency and repent of his attempts to make life work without God. Man must submit to the Creator and Colossians 1.16 and 17, a verse from this morning. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers or things. All things were created by him and for him. And, in, and he is before all things. And by him all things consist. All things are held together. Those two verses state reality. If God were to withdraw his personal care from creation, sometimes I think he's doing that from America right now, creation would become chaos. Creation exists only because of God's continued, wise, powerful, purposeful will. And that was willed where will and power are one. There is no way man can escape dependence upon God. Though he rebels against his creator, man is able, unable to escape. God designed us to be dependent upon him. And though he rebels, we are depend when we are independent of God... We're out of place. We need to get back in our place of dependence upon him. The proper response of one getting in the right place before God is what? Humility. Humility is the place of entire dependence upon God. I have a problem with that. People say I do. Humility is simply our acknowledging the truth about our position as man and yielding to God his place over us. That's humility. However, man's natural fallen tendency is to exalt self as life's final authority. Who is your final authority right now? Are you the final authority or is God? The final authority.
when a man recognizes that he is a rebel against God, God, and decides to, he, he decides to lay down his arms, he demonstrates humility and repentance. When man learns that he cannot make life work his way, but that he is in desperate need of God, he demonstrates humility by a continued sense of dependence upon God. Self, self, self exaltation. Maybe I'll get it right. Self exaltation spoils everything. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity voteth not itself, is not puffed up. As Augustine or Augustine said, humility is first, second, and third in Christianity. I like that. Humility is first, second, and third in Christianity. Listen to me. We were humble when we began our Christian life. We ought to live our Christian lives that way again. Often God brings us to the point, to that point again. But how does he do it? How does he humble us to the point that we become useful to him? Now he can use anybody. He used Nebuchadnezzar, he used Cyrus, he can use anybody. But how does he humble us to the point that we become useful to him? Just as our pride has many masks for rebellion, so God has many ways of exposing our self-dependence. If we are to be Christ-like, our pride must be exposed to ourselves. To others, yes, but to ourselves, our pride must be exposed to us. We must be humbled to be made like Christ. God doesn't humble us all the same way. He has many wrenches of many types and sizes in his toolbox to fix whatever problem he finds in us. Let's look at four ways God humbles us. Four ways that God humbles us. Number one, God can cause, can send us a problem. God can send us a problem that we cannot handle to expose our helplessness. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 1. I like this story. I'm not going to be reading the whole thing, but I think you'll get what I'm talking about when I read this first verse. It's about Naaman. Naaman, captain of the host of king of Assyria, king of Syria, was a great man and with his with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Listen to me. God can send us a problem that we cannot handle in order to expose our helplessness to ourselves. Naaman was a high-ranking military officer in Syria. And he had leprosy, a fatal disease, but through the tender concern of an Israelite slave girl, Naaman learned that Elisha, a prophet in Israel, could cure him. So, when Naaman decides to go there, but when Naaman approached Elisha's house... He didn't find the welcome that he wanted. Naaman was a great man. Naaman was a man of great position and rank. But Elisha didn't even show up to meet this Syrian general. There was no band, no pomp and circumstance. And instead of personally greeting Naaman, Elisha sent a messenger who told Naaman to go to the river Jordan and dip in the water seven times. Naaman was furious. For sure, he wanted change, but he want, but proud Naaman wanted change his way. 
Naaman wanted to choose how the message would be delivered, and he wanted to choose the river for his washing. Naaman's servant persuaded him to follow Elisha's direction, though, and had Elisha had Elisha directed him to do some great thing, Naaman would have been pleased to do so. Naaman finally humbled himself to seek God's to seek change God's way. It's interesting that the command was to dip in the water seven times. In other words, Naaman had to persist in following God's plan. He just couldn't do it and give up on it. He had to follow it even if it didn't work the first dip or the second dip or the third dip. So down to the seventh dip. He had to follow through with God's plan. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to follow through to the end of God's plan for us, whatever it might be. Here in Collingswood Bible Presbyterian Church or Knox Reformed Church in Tennessee, we've got to follow through with God's plan for us, step by step by step. The truth is that Naaman's biggest need was not to be cured from leprosy, but to be delivered from his selfish desire to live his life his way. (coughs) Excuse me. God can send us a problem that we can't handle to expose our helplessness. But God didn't just heal Naaman. God also changed Naaman's heart when Naaman humbled himself. Notice 2 Kings 5 verse 15. 2 Kings 5 verse 15. And Naaman returned to the man of God. He and all his company and came and stood before him and said, he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Like Naaman did, we go to God with our own agendas. I want things my way, God. We think we know that changes should occur in our lives and how those changes should come about. We think the blessings of life will be ours if we just control our lives. Often the tragedy is that the only time we bring God into the picture is when we ask him to help us make life work without him. In his mercy, God often drives us, gives us more than we can handle because we have been trusting our own way far too long. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not into thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. I want a healthy navel. I want marrow bones. I want to trust in the Lord. I don't want to trust in me. But what do I do? I stumble all over myself, trusting me. We need to trust God completely. There can be no Christ-likeness without humility. None. God can send us a problem we can't handle to expose our helplessness. Point number two. God can give us a command we won't obey to expose our selfishness. I love Jonah. Jonah is one of my favorite prophets in the, in the minor prophets. I guess really my favorite prophet is the one that I'm in at the time. But I love Jonah. God can give us a command we won't obey to expose our selfishness. Second Kings 14 verse 25. Second Kings 14 verse 25 says... Jeroboam restored the coast of Israel from the entering of 
Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spoke by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath Hefer, to be Christ-like. We don't need selfishness. We need humility. God worked humility in the prophet Jonah. 2 Kings 14.25 Jonah told King Jeroboam that God was going to restore the land they had lost to their enemies. Jonah enjoyed his popularity uh, as the prophet was delivered, as the prophet who delivered the good news of God's deliverance. Is that right? Yeah. But God knew of the stubbornness in Jonah's heart. And God knows of the stubbornness in my heart and in your heart. And God set out to expose that stubbornness and to humble Jonah. God gave Jonah a command that he knew Jonah would not obey in order to expose the prophet's selfishness. A man of God, selfish man of God. And God can give us a command that we won't obey to expose our selfishness. In my mind, in my mind I imagine this is how it went on Jonah's next assignment. God says to Jonah, Jonah, I see you enjoy delivering messages of redemption to the people. Jonah says, yes, Lord. You know how I love to tell the people about your deliverance. That last assignment was right on. Good, Jonah. (laughs) Because I have a special message of redemption I want you to take to Nineveh. I want... To offer them salvation. God, don't you know how brutal they are? When they bring their captives back to Nineveh, they dismember them from making big, heaping piles of body parts just to show everybody how Nineveh rules. Excuse me. Besides, nobody messes with the Ninevites, Lord. Nobody. They're awful, Lord, and they might do the same to me. I might have to go to Africa and live with a snake. Or wherever God wants us to go. To Knoxville and live with Jerry. Or to Collingswood. Excuse me, please. Besides, if I become an ambassador of good to them, what will my fellow Israelites think? They'll think that I betrayed them, God. I can't do it, Lord. It's too much to ask. I have spoken, Jonah. Your next assignment is Nineveh. Now, my, inag- my imagination is just that, imagination. But it captures the gist of Jonah's situation. God commanded his prophet to show love for the Ninevites. God also commanded Jonah to demonstrate divine love by doing what his neighbor needed most. Jonah refused exposing the, his rebel heart, so rather than face his assignment, Jonah ran. Nineveh was northeast, but Jonah went west to Spain, the farthest west in the known world. As far as Jonah knew, there was a great drop-off on the other side of Spain. But it wasn't long before God sent a great storm. You know the story, and the mariners threw Jonah overboard, where God's underwater, underwater wrench, or submarine seminary, Underwater wrench adjusted Jonah's attitude. And God will adjust our attitude too. These 
three days and three nights in the whale's belly, and Jonah humbled himself before God. That whale spat Jonah out, and Jonah made a big beeline to Nineveh with God's message. To Jonah's chagrin, the people repented and God relented. Jonah, outraged, threw a pity party. Have you done that? God, you can't send me there. I can't go there, Lord. They'll take me. Woe is me. Jonah threw a pity party because God extended mercy to the barbarians who terrorized the nations with brutality. Then... God provided a miraculous shade to shield Jonah from the sun, but God destroyed the shade and Jonah griped to God about destroying the local ecology. But it was just an excuse to vent anger to God. God drove the point home, though. That Jonah was more concerned about plants than about people. God exposed Jonah's pride. God often commands us, gives us commands that we refuse. We insist on going our way. But God made us dependent by design. And he must humble us as he did Jonah. There can be no Christ-likeness without humility. So far, we've covered God can give us a problem we can't handle in order to expose our helplessness. God can give us a command that we won't obey in order to expose our selfishness. Number three, <clears throat> God can arrange an outcome that we can't control to expose our sinfulness. This is the story of David and Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet. 2 Samuel 12, 11 and 12. 2 Samuel 12, 11 and 12. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and behold, before the Son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. David was shocked. He was shocked when he learned his adultery with Bathsheba would produce a child. Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, had been out of town on state business for months. It would be obvious to Uriah that the baby was not his. David didn't want that kind of exposure. Everyone thought that David was a godly man. After all, David had written many psalms used in worship. David was a preacher. He stood in the pulpit. Or there have been some. David was a saved man during this time. And he was a godly man. But everyone would now know the wickedness in David's heart. David had to do something. So he murdered Bathsheba's husband and kept quiet about it. But God sent one of his prophets. Here comes Nathan. And thou art the man where his words, as his long, I wish my finger were longer, as his long, bony finger aimed at a spot right between David's eyes. Thou art the man. Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. David's world came crashing down. Boom. God exposed David's evil. God will do the same with us. When David's sin was exposed, David was humbled. Listen 
Sin is heady stuff. I know sin is heady stuff. A man can start thinking that he is invincible. That he can control the outcome of his actions. That he can get away with evil. But understand something right here. And understand it now. God is sovereign. God exposes sin. Numbers 32 verse 23. Behold ye have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. God has made us dependent upon him by design. We must, he must humble us as he did David because there can be no Christ likeness without humility. By the time we get to heaven, we're going to be like him. If there's sin in your life, if there's sin in my life, we'd better repent now. For God will show it to the world in order to humble us. All right, let's go on. God can arrange an outcome that we can't control to expose our sinfulness. Then, number four, God can show us a God we can't understand to show us our finiteness. I love the story of Job. <laughs> as much as I love the story of Jonah. Job 1, 1, 2, and 3. There was a man in the land of Uz, Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance was also seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred she asses and every great household uh, and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men in the east. Job was the envy of every rancher in the land. His stock was the finest in the country, and Job's crops never failed. Through the years, he had become the wealthiest, most respected man in the area. And though he was a man of means, Job never thought of himself as superior. He was a godly man who helped others. Then things changed. Listen. God can show us a God we can't understand to show us our finiteness. For example, in one evening, a band of rustlers stole Job's entire stock in one section of the ranch. And a serious electrical storm started a fire in another person part of the ranch, destroying the rest of the herd. And as if that weren't enough, the same electrical storm spawned a tornado and toppled his son's house, killing all his children at the birthday celebration. Job and his wife would have been killed too, but they were late to the party. It's a good time to be late. Job was a respected man. He had wisdom and wealth, but he lost everything. And shortly thereafter, these shortly after these calamities, more woe came. Job finally lost his health, but Job didn't moan and groan or gripe and grumble like I would. Initially. Job responded with unshakable faith. faith. Listen to Job 1, 20 and 22. Then Job arose and went and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my father's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. 
Job was a man of God. Nevertheless, in chapter 3, Job began to question just why he was born. In chapter 23, Job longed for an audience with God to plead his cause and to discover why he endured such misery. God answered Job not with an explanation of the battle going on between him and Satan, but with a revelation from chapter 38 through 41 of the awesome power of God. Here is God's argument. Where were you, Job? When I did all these things in Job Job 38 through 41, where were you? And for four chapters, God questioned Job about the universe. When Job was confronted with the power and wisdom of God, Job humbled himself. What else could he do? Chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Job 42, 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered and understood not things too wonderful for me which I knew not. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, and now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job was not faced just with circumstances he couldn't understand, but with a God he couldn't comprehend. God can show us a God we can't understand to show us our finiteness. God exposed Job's finiteness. And the greatest preacher in the land today is a small creature. Job was a great man, but compared to God, Job was a tiny dot, a small man, a nothing. As a creature, Job could never understand the Almighty, but in view of the awesome power and wisdom of God, Job could and must trust God. Job could, and so must we. No other response is worthy of God. God has made no mistake in where he sends us and what he does for us and what he tells for us to do. And he deserves no rebuke. How can you do this to me, God? That's blasphemous. The creature cannot question the creator without revealing his own arrogance. God has made us dependent upon him by design. God, Job learned that the only response, the proper response during irrational times, and times are irrational today, the only response during irrational times is humility. Is God dealing with you in one of these ways? Is he exposing your lack of humility in one of these areas? The first step in putting off is repentance for having put on what God forbids. We must put off selfishness, pride, and self-rule. We must put off disobedience. We must put on humility. Because of God's mercy to us, 
Isn't it time for us to surrender ourselves as living sacrifices? That's our reasonable service. It's the least we can do. A man's potential for God lies not in his ability nor in his opportunity, but in his humility. God is not impressed with ability. Ability comes from God. God is not impressed with opportunity. Opportunity comes from God. God is impressed with humility because humility testifies to the sense of our dependence upon God. And God has made us dependent by design. 1 Peter 5, 6. 1 Peter 5, 6 tells us, Humble yourselves, therefore, before God, under the almighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. God can send us a problem that we cannot handle to expose our helplessness. God can give us a command that we won't obey to expose our selfishness. God can arrange an outcome that we can't control to expose our sinfulness. And God can show us a God we can't understand to show us our smallness. James 4.10 Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. And one day maybe you will, we will be Christ-like. Father, this is the day that you have made. You've given it to us. We didn't deserve it, Lord. But we thank you for it. We rejoice in it. We thank you for your word. We ask that you'd use it in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would make each of us Christ-like. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.